Who is the key that they forward in the next? Okay. Uh, so again, uh, good afternoon. My name is Guru Thapa, and I'm presenting some results of this study. And I'd like to specifically thank Dr. Brenda Booth, who is the principal investigator of this study. This study has been completed, and we've had several uh, manuscripts that have been published uh, from uh, this study. So uh, this afternoon, I'm focusing primarily on uh, predictors of cocaine use following an emer emergency department, and I'll refer to that as ED, visit for cocaine-associated chest pain. And basically, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the overview of cocaine-associated chest pain, and then the methods of the chest pain risk study. We called it the CPR study. And then discuss some demographic characteristics and baseline substance use of these study subjects. And then the main focus is, you know, what are the longitudinal rates of substance use in this population? And how much of the drugs do they use? And are there any factors that would help us predict subsequent uh, cocaine use? Now, cocaine continues to be a huge problem in the U.S. and I gather in you know, many other parts of the world. And it's the most common illegal drug uh, associated with ED visits in the U.S. In 2004, from a large national database, uh, nearly 41% of illicit drug mentions uh, for emergency department ED visits were related to cocaine. And chest pain is probably the most common reason why these individuals uh, present to the emergency uh, department. Uh, they literally think that they're having a heart attack and that's what brings them to the emergency room. And the physiological reason why <clears throat> we see this quite a bit is that uh, when you use cocaine, and especially if you use a lot and if you're using it frequently, uh, cocaine causes vasoconstriction or your blood vessels to tighten up and, you know, in your heart, your coronary blood vessels do not get enough blood, there is a rise in blood pressure, you get tachycardia or your heart rate increases, that can cause, you know, has the potential for causing irregular heartbeats, and it's also thought to influence the progression of uh, atherosclerosis if they keep using it long enough. And I won't go over this uh, figure. And it has been estimated that the risk of uh, a heart attack or an acute myocardial infarction is about 24 times greater during the hour after you use cocaine. And and the thing is, most of these individuals who do present with chest pain in the emergency department are, are fairly young, uh, and about 6% of them do have a history of uh, heart attack or atherosclerosis. Uh, and we also know that these episodes of chest pain continue to occur if these individuals continue to use it. So all the more reason why it's not a good idea to continue using it. And it's estimated that uh, cocaine may be responsible for nearly 25% of uh, heart attacks uh, in the 18 to 45 year age group. And they have a seven-fold lifetime <coughs> risk of non-fatal uh, heart attack uh, if they continue using it. So the, the problem has been in the past, at least in the US, is that when these individuals present to the emergency department having severe chest pain and thinking that they're having a heart attack, then what happens is, you know, the chest pain protocol, the original protocol kicks in, and these individuals end up in the intensive coronary care unit with a lot of monitoring, and it's a very, very expensive proposition. And what they finally figured out is that you know, these guys do not have, these individuals do not actually have a heart attack. It's really associated with uh, the effect of cocaine. And so they've developed uh, separate protocols whereby these individuals are kept in a observation unit next to the emergency department uh, while they're monitored, and then they get released so that the cost and the resources involved in um, treating these individuals is significantly reduced. 
Now, the problem we, with emergency department physicians for them is that they think that these individuals are chronic, they keep coming all the time, and, uh, and then they have a fairly negative uh, attitude towards this kind of patients, but there really has not been any study prior to this one as to, you know, do these individuals really, you know, continue to use, do they really end up coming back to the emergency department with chest pains? And uh, there's been only one study that followed a group of about 200 individuals who were presented to the emergency department with cocaine-associated chest pain. And uh, this was done in 1984. And they showed that 60% of these individuals continue to use cocaine. However, the follow-up was not very good. They had less than 50% uh, follow-up rates. And in addition, you know, these individuals, these investigators were focusing on uh, looking at more the cardiovascular side effects as opposed to uh, their substance use. So, so that is why this study was done to look at uh, the impact of cocaine used and other drug use at the same time and the longitudinal course of, you know, how much or do these individuals continue to use substances? And uh, then also looking at uh, whether we can identify factors that can help us develop uh, intervention strategies uh, for these individuals. So the name of this study was called the Chest Pain Risk Study, the CPR study. And basically, this was a prospective cohort uh, design. And essentially, the study took place not in Little Rock, Arkansas, even though you know, Dr. Booth and the principal investigators were in Little Rock. It actually took place up in Flint, Michigan, uh, in the Hurley Medical Center Emergency Department, which is a large inner city uh, hospital that sees uh, many of these kind of patients. And subjects were recruited from June through uh, 2002 through February 2004, and they were all followed up at three month intervals, six months, and 12 months after their baseline visit when they were uh, recruited into the study. And as I mentioned, Flint, Michigan, and for those of you who are not familiar with where Flint, Michigan is, this is where, this is about 60 miles away from uh, Detroit, and this is the home of General Motors and also home of the United Auto Workers. And it used to be a pretty uh, prosperous and bustling city in the early days when the American automakers were doing well, but things are not so good now. And so uh, the Hurley Medical Center is a large inner city uh, hospital. It's affiliated with the University of Michigan and some of our uh, co-investigators are from this uh, facility. And uh, basically, the other two points there talking about, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, for these individuals who come with chest pain and if there's a concern about cocaine use, then they're kept in this special observation unit and they're kept there for up to 12 hours. So it made it easy for our staff to recruit patients when they showed up there. The study subjects eligibility criteria, they had to be adults. <laughs> Uh, less than 60 years of age and presenting to the emergency department with chest pain, then they had to sign consent to have their medical records reviewed and they all had to give their drug screen and had to test positive for cocaine. And exclusion criteria, I won't go through the list, but basically the exclusion criteria was that if these individuals were actually showing signs of uh, or evidence of true uh, a heart attack, acute myocardial infarction, then they were excluded. In fact, most of them ended up going to the ICU. Or if they were hemodynamically unstable, so they were uh, excluded from the study. And in terms of subject recruitment, what happened was because this was a prospective cohort study, all individuals who presented to the emergency department with chest pain were screened. That meant, it, it, regardless of whether they were using cocaine or not, they were screened. Uh, our research uh, assistants had to get informed consent just to review the medical records to see if they met the criteria. So that was the phase one part of the study, the initial screening. And it was in phase two that these individuals who met criteria 
were then asked to consent for the main study, which included follow-up at three months, six months, and 12 months after their baseline interview. The data we collected, I won't go into the details of this, was a very extensive battery of tests that looked at uh, DSM-4 criteria for making diagnosis of uh, various substance abuse. There were screening tools assessing psychological uh, distress, physical functioning, uh, as well as uh, uh, depression, stages of change, SF36, and also we looked at uh, a scale called the INDUC R Inventory of Drug Use Consequences, which looks at uh, the consequences that experiencing a lot of uh, adverse consequences of drug use could be a surrogate indicator that these were ones who were more hardcore users and you know more likely to use uh, anyway. So the limitation of the study, as I mentioned, was that you know, we, we relied on self-report of substance use. However, we did, you know, test their urine at the time of each follow-up interview, and the literature suggests that when patients or subjects are told that they're going to be tested, then they tend to be a little more forthcoming about their uh, substance use. And the participation rates were, you know, 70%, and one could argue out of the 301, uh, you only had 290. Uh, but when we did a demographic comparison of the participants and non-participants, we did not find any, excuse me, any significant differences that caused us concern about the validity. And we also did an attrition analysis, uh, and we did not find any significant uh, differences between participants and non-participants. So, <clears throat> in conclusion, basically. You know, what we found is that, you know, clearly this kind of a life-threatening event uh, does influence these individuals, and we found there was, you know, nearly half, you know, 50% decrease in use, and we did not find a substitution effect with other drugs, so that was reassuring. And we also found that by, you know, doing less drugs, they had better consequences uh, of substance abuse, <coughs> and, at least in our group, we did not find substance use patterns being affected by whether they went into uh, substance abuse treatment or not. However, again, we don't know the degree, type, or extent of the substance abuse treatment that they went into. So, in terms of identifying predictors, again, you know, most of the literature is focused on treatment samples. This is a non-treatment <coughs> sample. And even among non-treatment samples, this is one very uh, targeted group of individuals who are presented with, an, uh, again, chest pain associated with cocaine use. So it, they're not very representative. And the predictors that we found, you know, being African American, being all that, I mean, I think that's helpful, but we were not able to, as we had hoped, get something more clear, uh, get a better picture of that. So basically, at the end of the day, what we feel is that uh, when somebody is faced with this life-threatening event, they, I mean, these guys are young, fairly young, and they're presenting the emergency department mm -hmm. thinking they're having a heart attack. I mean, that's quite scary. And, and this could probably be a very uh, you know, important motivator for them to change their lifestyle. And, and this is also consistent with the substance abuse literature uh, indicating that generally individuals who have addiction problems who encounter some kind of negative consequences, be it physical or emotional, you lose a job or you get hurt and get into a serious accident or you end up you know, you know, with the legal system in jail, then uh, the literature does indicate that these events tend to influence, uh, you know, their use, and and we feel that again, you know, presenting with this kind of a picture in the emergency department could be important. The other important possibility is also the fact that when you're in the emergency departments, half scared to death, 
and your doctor and the nurses say, this was the cocaine that did it. This is cocaine. You don't have a heart attack. Cocaine. You got to stop cocaine. So it's kind of a you know, brief targeted intervention, if you will. And so this is a sort of a teachable moment. And, and, and this factor could also influence what they're doing. So our findings suggest that in this subset of cocaine users, that you know this event uh, may be enough to motivate them not to use. Now, nevertheless, again, you know, using some of the predictors that we find, targeting, developing targeted intervention for this group would, would definitely, uh, you know, help them. And that's all I have. Uh, we'll go to the next speaker and we'll hold the questions for the end. Okay. Our next speaker is uh